Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of God. John chapter 5, verse number 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify. If your pen was mine, I will underline that. They are they, that is the scriptures are they, which testify of me. This is Jesus speaking. The word search is the word investigate. Investigate the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures are my testimony. Meaning, Jesus is the message of the scriptures. John chapter 1 verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write jesus of nazareth the son of joseph he's the one moses in the law and the prophets did write all right now look at your bibles we are still establishing this foundation in the book of luke chapter 24 verse 25 when jesus rose from the dead on the way to emmaus he met two disciples and arguably cleopas and his wife and they were discussing the events of the past three days. And Jesus said to them, gentlemen, what are you guys talking about? And they said to Jesus, are you a stranger in town? Have you not heard about Jesus, a good guy that was killed the other day? They were preaching Jesus to Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. You can be in church and never know Jesus and be lost in religion. Religion is man's efforts to go to God or to look for God. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with God where God doesn't wait for you to come to him where God has come to us. That's the difference between Christianity and religion. So they thought Jesus was a Messiah, a good guy who died. So Jesus turned to them in verse 25 and he said unto them, O fool, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, if you are reading well, you should have known that Christ... To have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses. Beginning at Moses. Achemosios in the Greek. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Moses wrote in the law and the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. The things concerning himself in all the scriptures beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded only there was a bias there is a bias to bible study there is a bias in bible teaching he did not expound everything he expounded only the things concerning himself why because the scriptures testifies of him Look at John chapter 5 verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. This is Jesus talking. There is one that accuses you. Even Moses in whom you trust. Beginning at Moses. Even Moses in whom you trust. Look up everybody. Jesus is saying I'm not the accuser here. I will not accuse. I do not accuse. There is one that accuses the accuser of the brethren is Moses. Now Moses not as a person, but Moses as a system. Moses as a function. Alright, beginning at Moses. It's not a person. When he said beginning at Moses, he's talking about the writings of Moses or the teaching ministry of Moses. Remember ladies and gentlemen, that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy was the teaching ministry of Moses to the Jews. It was Moses' teaching that was documented. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy was Moses communicating Christ to his audience in those books. So, Genesis is the promise of an Exodus. When Moses was teaching them Genesis, he was expounding and showing them the promise that there is an Exodus coming. So, Genesis is the promise of God of an exodus. Because exodus is a type of moving out of bondage into rest which is in Christ. It's a typology. And all of that was Moses' teaching to the Jewish people. 
And so when Moses began the book, he began by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Barashit Elohim Barat, it is Shemayim's letter Aret. That's the Hebrew. What he meant is that in the deadless past, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the word that was God became a man. So Jesus is the word that became flesh. So in the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made remember all things were made by him for him through him so he is the reason the logic the logos god's thinking pattern is the idea the thought the intent is the reason behind all of creation so he created all things for himself so in the beginning god created is christocentric is the message of Christ creating all things. The next verse, the earth was without form void. Darkness was upon the face of the dead. The, and the spirit of God moved. So Jesus was the spirit of God moving in the face of darkness. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. That light was Jesus. Because that light was not moon and star. Because later on you will see the creation of moon and star. So that light was Jesus in the darkness. The heart of a man that is not saved. So when he said, let there be light, he was calling the light to shine out of darkness, which has shone in our hearts. The book of 2 Corinthians, where brother Paul brought the revelation out. Because remember, the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. I repeat, the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. Let me add a little more. The Old Testament must be explained. The Old Testament must be explained. Now remember, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. Now look at that John. John chapter 5 verse 45. Observe. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Now observe the next thing. For had you believed Moses... You would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Had you believed Moses. You would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Meaning Moses wrote two things. Number one he wrote accusation. Number two he wrote Christ. So in Genesis there is a segment for Christ. And there is a segment for accusation. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses wrote two messages. So now it is left for the pastor to rightly divide accusation, trash it, and feed you Christ. Because Christ is the diet of the believer, not the accusation of Moses. But in the books of Moses, there is accusation and there is Christ. That's why the word must be rightly divided. We looked at Moses and we brought out Christ from the books that Moses wrote. And I'm not about to go back like I said. So in Genesis is the seed of the woman. In Exodus is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus he is the offerings. All the offerings in the book of Leviticus. In Numbers and Deuteronomy he is the brazen serpent on the pole. He is the water that came out of the rock. He is the manna that was typified by the manna in the wilderness. And in Deuteronomy he is a prophet like unto Moses. Because in Deuteronomy, Moses said to them, A prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise. Him shall you hear. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Acts chapter 3 verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall you hear in all things. Whatsoever he shall say unto you. Next verse. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Why? Because whosoever believes in him shall not perish. He that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Moses already told them. There's a prophet like unto me. So in Deuteronomy, he is a prophet like unto Moses. Alright? Now, 
We got out of Deuteronomy. Now we're done with Moses. We move to the next books of the Bible. In Joshua, he is that scarlet robe that was given to Rahab the harlot. That scarlet robe. Scarlet is red, which is symbolic of the blood. And because Rahab believed and took the robe and held one side and the children of those spies held the other side, there was a connection between Rahab and God's people. So by that typology, Rahab believed in the gospel of the blood. That's how Rahab became a righteous person. So that scarlet was symbolic of Christ in the book of Joshua. That is what is symbolic. The scarlet robe. And we can go on and on and bring out other revelations. I'm just giving you teasers to help you see. In Judges, he is a secret. Because in the book of Judges, chapter 13, verse 18, he talks about secret. He is a secret. Same word as wonderful. The name in Isaiah. Which means the word secret, which is wonderful, is figurative. It's a figurative representation of Jesus. Remember, the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. The Old Testament is mystery. The New Testament is revelation. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, to understand the Old Testament, you will have to wear the binoculars of the New Testament and look at the Old Testament. It's one book. The Bible is not books. It's one book. And the message of the Bible is not you will make it. It's not you will succeed. It's not you stole your wedding gown. It's not 15 keys or 35 pillars. The message of the Bible is a person. His name is Jesus. And anything preached out of the Bible that is not Jesus is a waste of your time. The message of the scriptures is Jesus. He's the diet that believers feed on. Then in the book of Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. Yeah, he's the kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, we see him in the sufferings and the rejections of the enthronement of David. Because before Jesus became Lord, he was rejected. He suffered. So in the sufferings and rejection of David, there was a symbolic communication of how Christ will be rejected. And he will suffer and he will die and he will rise and glory will follow. That's in 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st and 2nd Samuel. In the book of 1st and 2nd Kings, we see Jesus as the redeemer than Solomon. And we see Jesus as the greater than the temple. In Matthew eleven forty two, Jesus talked about one that is greater than the temple. Matthew eleven forty two. So Jesus said there is one greater than the temple in this place. Because when we see in the books, we see the glory of the kings. The glory of the kings of Israel. Of which we see Jesus having a greater glory and dominion than the kings of Israel. So, their royalty was symbolic of the reign of Christ. In Ezra, we see the explanation of the nail. The nail that was used on Jesus' hands. Ezra. You will see that explanation. In Nehemiah, because of time, I told you, I'm just giving you teasers. In Nehemiah, he is the rock that Nehemiah spoke about. And he is the bread from heaven in Nehemiah. In Esther, interestingly, Esther is one book that does not have the name of God. The entire book is written without the mention of God in the entire book of Esther. And that's why some people who don't have understanding, when they read the book of Esther, they use it for pageant, beauty pageant. You know, and you hear people say, one night with the king, what an insult. Why will I be going for one night with the king when the king lives inside me? Why do I want to have a one night stand with the king when the king lives in me forever? I don't need one night with the king. I have eternity with the king. Glory to God. He lives in me. You know, when people don't understand the gospel, you are given an aspiration gospel. A gospel where you are aspiring to be. The gospel of Christ is not aspiration. The gospel of Christ is what has been done already. You don't aspire anything in the gospel. You only receive what has been done. So that one night with the king is a scam. There's nothing like that. You and Christ are together forever. I will never leave nor forsake you. I will be with you forever. 
So you don't need one night. You have forever. Isn't that some good news here tonight? So Esther is one book where there is no mention of God. And that's why people who are not understanding the message of the scripture can use the book of Esther for all kinds of things. But it's actually the message of Christ. How does Christ come into the book of Esther? Esther could not see the king on, until after three days of fasting. So she asked the whole of Jerusalem, Israel, to fast together with her. And that on the third day, she will appear before the king and ask for the redemption of Israel from their enemy, Mordecai. And if she perish, she perish. And that was a type of death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus died, was buried. On the third day, he arose and he went up to the right hand of the father and appeared before the king on your behalf. And I have news for you. And that was your redemption that was your freedom from the oppression from the chains of darkness and he delivered you from the kingdom of darkness and has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son when he died you died when he was buried you were buried when he rose you rose am i talking to somebody here he has quickened us together and raised us up together and made us sit together with him where in the heavenly So the message of Esther is the message of death, burial, and resurrection. Listen carefully, everybody. No book is allowed in the scripture that doesn't have the message of Christ. There are extra books, but those books are useless because they don't have Christ in them. A book only passed the test of being canonized when it had Christ in it. So the 66 books are tied together by one message. And that message is Christ. It's the message of Christ. Remember, our theology is Christology. Our theology is Christology. The Bible is a theology. And the theology of the Bible is Christology. But in the study of Christology, we arrive at the mission of Christ, which is soteriology. And when you study soteriology, the essence and the reality of his death, burial, and resurrection, which brought salvation, is only made visible in your heart by the spirit, the work and the work of the spirit, which is pneumatology. Pneumatology. And the practice of pneumatology is ecclesiology, which is our study in relationships. Is our study in relationships. Stay with me, stay with me. I want to show you through the scriptures. So that if anybody's preaching nonsense, you shut him down. Don't let anybody waste your time with anything that is not Christ from the scriptures. The Bible is not a book of business principles. It's the message of Christ. The Bible is not a book of agriculture. Even though Jesus talked about a sower that sowed a seed. But if you observe, he wasn't teaching business principles. Because when he finished, he said, the seed is the word of God. He opened up what he was talking about. So he was using natural situation to communicate spiritual realities. Why? Because the audience had a low IQ. Parable is a method of communicating with people who are spiritually dull. People that are spiritually alert. You don't use parables. You speak with plainness of speech. And when you got born again, you were quickened to understand revelation. So that's why we don't use parables for you. We give you revelation knowledge. Nehemiah, Esther, the one that out of due time became our mediator and intercessor. In the book of Job, I am a hata. In the book of Job, he's the day's man redeemer, the day's man mediator. Job said, Oh, I wish I have a man. I have someone that will speak to God on my behalf and will speak to me on God's behalf. A mediator, one that stands between me and God, that will tell God what I'm going through and that will explain to me what God has to say. And today we have a mediator between God and man. And that mediator that Job was looking for, we have him physically today. His name is Jesus. And with the hope of the mediator, Job said, I know that my redeemer leave it. Even if my body is rotting, in this rotting flesh, I shall see God. He had hope in the mediatorship of Jesus. He could see it ahead 
even though he couldn't lay hands on it because it was not for their time it was kept for our time and today we have the reality of what christ has done we are that people that are born in due season we are recipients and partakers of the glory of god in the face of jesus if your amen is louder enjoy the grace of god When I tell you the Bible is the book of Jesus, I'm not making noise. I know what I'm talking about. In the book of Psalms, the Atoba, he spoke of Jesus, the anointed of God. And then in chapter 22 of Psalm, he talked about the sufferings of Christ. The bulls of Bashan have buffeted me. Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor allow thy holy one see corruption. And then he prophesied, lift up your head, O ye gates. Be lifted up everlasting doors and let the king of glory come in and and the regions of hell shouted who is this king of glory and prophetically they answered them he is the lord mighty he is the lord mighty in battle lift up your head O ye gates and on the third day jesus rose David talked about the sufferings of Christ. He talked about the reign of Jesus. He talked about the three days in hell. David, the book of Psalms, is the book of Jesus. It's not a book for midnight prayer. It's not a book to be reciting. It's the revelation of Jesus. Psalm 16 talks about the reign of Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. He's not talking about another day other than the day of resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was that day of rejoicing. He said, hold me not back. I've not gone to my father, your father, my God, your God. But tell my brethren, tell my brethren, tell my brethren. For both he that sanctify and they that are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Somebody shout, Jesus is my brother. Say, we are family. Whenever we see Jesus seated, we see him seated as the high priest. These are Christocentric scriptures. In the book of Proverbs, he is the wisdom of God. Proverbs 8.1, he is the wisdom of God. In Proverbs 4.8, he is the path of the righteous that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. That perfect day was the day of resurrection. In Proverbs 16.15, he is the shorty of a sinner. The shorty of a sinner. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, he is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and they are saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the book of Proverbs, he is a brother that stick it closer than a friend. He is a friend that stick it closer than a brother. He is one among thousands. In the songs of Solomon, he is a shepherd, the groom, speaking of us and him, the marriage that can never be divorced, the union that can never be separated. That is all that the book of Solomon is painting. The picture of Christ and the church. And that union that cannot be broken because of his resurrection. In the book of Isaiah, it brings us a lot of revelations on the sufferings of Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, you are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every man has gone into his own way. It pleased God to bruise him on our behalf. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah took time to open it. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And brother Paul will put it like this. They that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness they shall reign in life through one jesus christ our lord the book of isaiah he's the king that reigns in righteousness he is the appointed one isaiah 12 35 isaiah 12 35 the king that reigns in righteousness he is the well of salvation with joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. Isaiah 12 verse 3. In Isaiah 59. He is our intercessor. The mediator. 
In Jeremiah, all the names of God reveals the character of Christ. In Jeremiah, he is called El Shaddai. He is called Nisi. He is Nisi. He is El Shaddai. Jeremiah 23 verse 5. In Jeremiah 33, 15, he is the Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah Sid Keno. In Ezekiel, he is the true shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, the true shepherd, the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20, the great shepherd, the true shepherd, John 10. Ezekiel 34, 23, he is the true shepherd. In Ezekiel 48, he is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord shall be seen there. The Lord shall be seen there. The revelation of God. Shama. Ayatoba. In the book of Daniel is the son of man. Daniel 7.16. Son of man. Daniel 9.24. Messiah. In Joel. In Hosea before Joel. He's a son out of Egypt. The son out of Egypt. You remember when he was born? He was asked to go out of Egypt. Hosea prophesied it. In the book of Hosea. In the book of Joel, he is the spirit. I poured my spirit upon all flesh. In the book of Joel, is God dwelling in Zion. Joel 3.17. What I'm giving is the substance of scripture. In the book of Amos, he is the salvation promised. Amos 9.11-12. In Obadiah, he is the deliverer of Zion. In Mount Zion, <laughs> there shall be deliverance and holiness. And the sons of Jacob shall possess their possessions. He is the deliverer in Zion. In Jonah, Jonah 2.9, salvation is of the Lord. Out of the belly of the whale. Jonah acted out the drama of death, burial, and resurrection. On the way to Tashish, they threw him into the sea. And the fish swallowed him three days. And Jonah said, in hell I cried, salvation is of the Lord. And the fish opened his mouth on the third day and vomited Jonah. Jesus died three days. On the third day he rose. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Jonah, that is a sign that shall be given to this generation. Death, burial, and resurrection. The message of Jonah was clearly the message of God's salvation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's his book. That book belongs to Jesus. Nobody else. Nobody else. Nobody else. It's the book of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Micah, he is the pre-existent nature of God. Micah 5.2 in Nahum, he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. Stronghold. Nahum 1.7. In Habakkuk, he's a faith of Christ. The just shall live by faith. In Haggai, he's a desire of all nations. Haggai 2.7. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. Jesus is that desire of all nations. In Zechariah, he is a shepherd that was smitten and the sheep scattered. In Zechariah, he's the shepherd that was smitten and the sheep scattered. Zechariah 13 verse 7. In Malachi. In Malachi. He testifies. Of Jesus. And John the Baptist. Was going to be a forerunner. In Malachi 4.2. He is called the son of righteousness. So the epistles. Are not magical books. They explain. What was contained in Genesis. To Malachi. With the benefit of the new. We can now see Genesis to Malachi. As types and shadows. Of Christ. You search the scripture. So an accurate study of the Bible is therefore to see the scriptures through Christ. To see the scriptures through Christ. Once you cannot see the scriptures through Christ, you are lost. Once you lose sight of the scriptures, you'll be in the bush. 
Look at Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. It's not an end of the world disposition. Because we have used that as a message of doom. That statement in itself. When you say all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. It shows you a relationship. Heaven and earth is a mode of communication to show you a relationship that exists between immortality and mortality. Heaven and earth. And we said that the gospel is a relationship. The resurrection of Jesus, which is the gospel, is a relationship and not just a mere event. So the resurrection of Jesus, therefore, is a present tense reality. Why? Because the gospel is a relationship. The gospel is also the resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus is a relationship. Remember, lo, I am with you always. So the gospel, which is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is a relationship. Every time you go out to preach, every time you go out to announce, the resurrection. The relationship that God has extended to mankind. Now, we said that salvation can be achieved within microseconds. But discipleship is a lifetime. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go and make disciples, teaching them. The word matetio in the Greek. Matetio. Where you have math, etio. It means to make people learn. It's talking about systematic learning. Organized learning. Not haphazard learning. The church ought to be a place where you are given a course of study. Not haphazard scattered preaching. Not inspirational preaching. Not motivation. Uh -uh. Systematic theology. And organized theology. Where you go from module to module. That's how the church ought to be. Because the mission of the church is to equip, to train, and produce disciples who are able to disciple others. So there must be organized theology. Systematic theology. And if you observe, Brother Paul's theology, what we call the Pauline theology, is systematic. If you observe the teaching ministry of Jesus was systematic theology. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Systematic. Not just scattered preaching. You know? Not preaching at people's needs. Not preaching to help people arrive. Where are you arriving? You arrived. You are in Christ. Anywhere you are arriving that is not Christ, you have missed Christ. Christ is the final bus stop. He is the destination point. But motivators will tell you, you will get there. And you ask them, where is there? They say, there's a place called there. So, the church ought to teach. Look at that Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, ethos, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. And we said a Christian cannot grow without teaching. You cannot. Teaching there is the word didasko in the Greek. D-I-D-A-S-K-O. Didasko. And I've given you the compound words. We have didasko. Which means to teach or to instruct. Then we have didache. D-I-D-A-C-H-E An explanation Didache An explanation Look at Matthew 7.28 Where the word Didache is applied Matthew 7.28 And it came to pass When Jesus had ended these sayings The people were astonished At his doctrine At his explanation At his Didache At that is the way he explains scriptures his mode of explanation, doctrine, 
Daidachi. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' Daidachi. Apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. The apostles' Daidachi. They continued steadfastly. In the way the apostles explained the scriptures. Daidachi. In Acts 5.28 when they accused the disciples saying did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name and behold you have filled jerusalem with your didache you have filled jerusalem with your explanation and intend to bring this man's blood upon us you have filled jerusalem with your doctrine didache your explanation in Matthew 16, 12, Jesus warned his disciples. Matthew chapter 16, verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the living of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The doctrine, the didache, the explanation of the Pharisees. Beware of the explanation of the Sadducees and Pharisees. They are selfish explanation. They are covetous explanation. They are materialistic explanation. And you know, people who preach materialism, every verse of the scripture is for money. Every verse they see in the Bible, they must corner it for money, including the books of the Bible. Psalm 91. 91 dollars for 91 blessings. Materialistic gospel. Jesus warned the disciples to beware of such teachers. To beware of such people. It doesn't matter the title on their names and the size of chain on their neck and the size of collar on their throat. It is not about dressing and chain. It's about content. Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. The didache of or explanation they have a legalistic explanation. That is not the true explanation of the scriptures. So the word there is the word didache. Then we have the word didascalia. Didascalia. We have didascalia. That is the body of truth. When you put together everything I've been teaching you about Christ, about the law and the prophets in Christ's realities, soteria, when you put all of the modules together, it is called didascalia. That is a body of truth. A body of truth I have delivered to you that has formed the basis for your persuasion. That has formed the basis for your relationship with God. It's called didascalia. That is the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ, therefore, will be how Christ is the interpretation of Genesis to Malachi. The doctrine of Christ is how Christ is the explanation of Genesis to Malachi. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 1 to 3. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Next verse. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words, the word hugaino in the Greek, wholesome, healthy, healthy, sound, Put it back. Wholesome words. Even. Now he explained what he means by wholesome words. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the words of our Lord Jesus Christ is the doctrine which is according to godliness. Anybody that avoids teaching Christ. Anybody that shies away. That says Christ is too much. Any church where Christ is not the message. Is a club. You are hanging out in a club. You are not in a church. 
What defines a church is not the building design. What defines a church is the content that people are fed. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Sayadaba. Behold, I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil and nothing shall by hurt you. If you are still afraid, you need to be born again. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Shadola Kotama. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry. They give you water, they say there's witchcraft. Take it. Drink it. Nonsense. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. There is no portion for witchcraft. Both the witches and everything, they belong to God. God owns the world. Get out of fear. And if you are still in fear, get born again. And if you don't know how to be born again, come for counseling. We are here tomorrow 9 a.m. Come and meet us. We will sort you out quickly. Flush out the nonsense. Clean you up. Wash your brain. Wash it well. Wash the nonsense. Put light inside. Dabola. Ne kwa twa. Kwa twa twa twa. Zibana. Say I'm born of God. Shout it, let the devil hear you. Shout it louder. Say it like you know what you're talking about. Say I have the DNA of God in my inside. God is not afraid. I'm not afraid. As he is, so am I. What cannot fight him? Cannot fight me. What cannot defeat him? cannot defeat me i am dead my life is hid with christ in god i didn't hear powerful amen when the gospel is preached demons and devils go to hide the reason why people are afraid all over the land is because people have not been taught the gospel people have only been taught traditional religion Going to church is a natural family culture. So they don't know why they go. They just go. Because everybody has to go to church. So they have a form of godliness. But denying the power. And from such, turn away. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. As many as receive him to them. Gave him. To become the sons of God. Even as many as believe in his name. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is there. Of God unto salvation. Somebody shout power three times. Two. Three. Somebody shout the doctrine of Christ. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 He says uh, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things Like I'm doing now Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ Nourished up In the words of faith And of good doctrine Whereunto Thou hast attained Somebody shout good doctrine Say it again Sound Doctrine where Christ is taught from all the Old Testament books and properly so didascalia now the person who teaches didascalia is called didascalos I am your didascalos didascalos that's the person who teaches it but the very act of teaching is didasco didasco in case you are making notes, so you can go and write something. Didascalos is D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-O-S. 
Didasco is D I D A S K O. You cannot have a growing Christian. You cannot have a disciple of Jesus without teaching. Where there is no teaching, people cannot be discipled. You can have crowd. You can have an audience. You can have people who are in church every Sunday. They attend service like fans. They come to church to see the latest thing. In some churches, this week is music concert. Next Sunday, comedy Sunday. The Sunday of a thousand love. Another Sunday, singles mingle and double with mingling. Another Sunday, warfare Sunday, Koboko service. Another Sunday, a guest speaker who will now come and do Bible teaching because the pastor is a coordinator. Week after that, business empowerment. Trying to be a multipurpose center. But that's not what Jesus asks us to do. That's not what Jesus asks us to do. Teaching them to observe the things that I have commanded. Not to teach everything. You teach the things he has commanded. So the things he has commanded are the things about himself. Not a series on how to fish. How to fish. How to build a fish pond. And produce anointed fishes. Because they were fishermen in Jesus time. Or how to collect taxes. Because Matthew was a tax collector. Or how to build like Paul. Real estate in the 21st century. In the church. They were to teach his resurrection. They were to teach his resurrection. Because his resurrection is a relationship. Make disciples of every nation. Disciples of what? Disciples of his resurrection. It means that you must not allow your culture. Especially when you are born in a particular group in a particular country or nation. You must not allow that to influence your lifestyle against the word of God. Let me add this very quickly. The scriptures are meant to confront you. The, the mission of Bible teaching is confrontation. The scriptures are meant to confront you. What do I mean by that? They are meant to confront your beliefs. The scriptures are not written to agree with you. When I'm teaching, people come on my page, I don't agree. He has not even had anything. I don't agree. That's an illiterate talking. Intelligent people don't talk. They wait to hear everything. When they have had everything, they ask intelligent questions. When they are finished asking their questions, then they arrive at a conclusion. Don't just appear and say, I don't agree. That thing he says is not true. The woman is not the helper for the man. No, it's not true. See, illiterate. The word help me is the word Ezra. Ezra is used 22 times and it is only used for God. So God is the helper of both man and woman. The wife is not the helper. It's God. Ezra. And where that verse was written was after Genesis where the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then God says it's not good for a man to be alone. I will give him a help. That help is Jesus who came to help man from his decision against the gospel. But when you, do, when you don't listen, you, you bring your CRK knowledge into the headquarters of revelation knowledge. You start shouting, I don't agree. I don't have CRK. Most TR, some CRK teachers are not even born again. They are not even Christians. They are smoking and teaching. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1 verse 1. Then that, that year, year you learn, you now want to come and, 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 and be disagreeing with revelation knowledge. Is something not doing you? <laughs> 
The scriptures are not written to agree with you. The scriptures are written so you agree with them. You are the one to agree with the scriptures. That's why it will confront you. Profitable for teaching. Didascalia. Explanation. Scriptures. Which is to convince you. Reproof. Electro. Which is also to bring you to correction. A fanatosis. Which is to set you right. And then out of that. To instruct you which is spiritual growth. The scriptures are not for you to agree with them. Because I think in my opinion. That is the way I even see the scriptures. Someone said Dr. Damina. Why are you so controversial? Dr. Damina you are so controversial. Why won't I be controversial? The book I am preaching from is a controversial book. The Bible is already a controversial book. And if that's what I'm preaching, that's why I sound controversial. I am only controversial to the wrong things you have put in your head. Which if you calm down, we wash them out. It's called the renewing of the mind. The Bible on its own is a controversial book. The Bible says it, it is settled, I believe it. Despite your opinion. Despite your opinion. It's not about how you feel about the Bible. It's not about how you feel about the Bible. The truth of the scriptures is that you must agree with the scriptures. In fact, you believe it first before you understand it. <laughs> That's Bible for you. You have to believe it first. Then you begin to understand it. We're teaching you, God, I don't agree. That you are who? That you are who? I don't. That you are who? Who cares whether you agree or not? What matters to us is what the book says. I don't agree. That you are who? If you are that an authority, why don't you open your own page and teach your own there? Why are you coming to our own to say, I don't agree? Because you have nowhere to say it. So you, you found where people are. You now want to alter your unpopular opinion against the instituted authority of God's word. I think I should close. The Bible is Christ-centered. It's centered on Christ. Dr. Damina, why are you controversial? You, why are you normal? Don't you know that normalcy is not good? Life has no respect for normal people. <laughs> Was Jesus normal? Eh? The law say you should not do anything on Sabbath day. Jesus went out on Sabbath day and started healing people. <laughs> he went against the law. They say, why are you healing on Sabbath? He said, which of you shall have a goat on a Sabbath day and the goat fall inside a hole and you won't bring it out? They kept quiet. He walked away. Very controversial guy. He looks at their temple. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. He said, you must be mad. How old are you? This temple took us 46 years. He said, don't worry. You will understand later. He didn't even care to explain. If you like, understand. If you like, don't understand. All I have said is pull down the temple. Me, I will build it up. Then after his resurrection, they now understood that what he meant was the temple of his body. Meaning that temple doesn't carry God. This is what carries God. Stand on your feet this morning. Somebody shout glory. Tell somebody my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Tell somebody I house God. Tell somebody if you are looking for the presence of God. Don't look very far. This is the presence of God. I carry his presence. I wear his presence. I move with his presence. I didn't hear that. Amen like thunder. Lift your right hand. Father, I ask that revelation knowledge grows and grows and grows until nothing else matters. That the eyes of your people's understanding be flooded with light. Barriers terminated. Obstacles are broken. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Sickness and disease humiliated. Satan embarrassed. In the name of Jesus. I decree that you function in your authority. 
you function in your authority reign over sickness reign over sickness reign over disease reign over failure in the name of jesus thank you father for answered prayer thank you father for the blessing in this service in jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality grab your offering let's give in honor of the word of god when we teach the word we ask people to give to honor the word of god to honor what christ has done and today we have asked the counselor in another two or three minutes i'll be joining mr michael bush and we'll answer ask the counselor and uh, thereafter we'll do other things that we need to do in this service grab a good offering everybody those watching online the banking details are there on television. The banking details are there. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush, you read the banking details for you while the, as the counselor is on. So grab your offerings, everybody. I'd like you to lift up your offerings. We want to pray right now. Father, we give in faith and we give in honor of Christ. Our offerings are a sweet smell before you. And we thank you for the privilege of giving. I decree that this week, anyone here with a need, your needs are met supernaturally. Receive the manifestation in the name of Jesus. God supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. The online and radio audience, you don't want to go away because of Ask the Counselor in another fight.